Welcome to Rational Alchemy. We have a very special panel with us today, so maybe the show should probably be called Rational Politics. It could even be called Political Alchemy. The revolution continues. I have got a group of Democrats with me who are all Bernie supporters, as am I. And we have decided to do this program to sit down and talk about the revolution, where it's been, where it is, and where it's going. Let me introduce my guests. To my left first is Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Sherry. I have uh, got involved with Bernie back in uh, October, heavily with the campaign, and been working with him since. Secondly, Lynette. Hi, my name is Lynette McLean, and I uh, started working on the Bernie campaign in um, about March uh, or April of 2015. Had my first event in May, and I was hired to be one of his staff members. So that's how I have my involvement. Jerry. I'm Jerry Shepard. I first had a Bernie event at my house uh, roughly a year and a half ago. We got us together to mm -hmm. encourage Bernie to run as a Democrat, and I've done various things, canvassed, phone banged. I was involved on the House district level as a training caucus person and um, basically pestered all my friends to uh, register as Democrats and support Bernie. Dwayne. Dwayne Lease. And I'm a little different from the other three here. All three of these uh, people have all were delegates to the National Convention. And that had to be a, a wonderful experience, but I did not have the time and, and couldn't make it. But uh, I first heard about Bernie uh, on the Tom Hartman show. And that was oh, probably about six years ago. And I think with Bernie, more than anything else, if you can hear him speak like around a table, he makes so much sense. And a lot of the stump speeches that he had, I don't think really did him justice from, from what I knew of Bernie. <clears throat> Thank you. Everybody, welcome. It's so good of you to make time to come along and do this program. What we actually did was we asked everyone to submit questions and we put all the questions together. Um, but there were a couple of questions that I wanted to ask on my own. These are my questions. So this first question is actually my, my question. I'm a Brit, as you all know, for my sins. <laughs> and I believe that there is a lot of confusion as to where Bernie really fits in in the political spectrum. Because depending on who you listen to, I heard people call him a socialist. I heard people call him a far left socialist. I even heard people accuse him of being a communist. I lived under many socialist governments in the 60s and the early 70s in Great Britain. People like Harold Wilson, Michael Foote, James Callaghan, they were socialists. They were true hard socialists. They, they wanted to nationalize everything, you know, and, and something that we never heard at all from Bernie. So what I wanted to do was have a quick round table here, okay, and explain the difference between where you think Bernie sits and where you believe, well, no, just tell me where Bernie fits on the, on the political spectrum. Um, there was a lot of things about Jeremy Corbyn, who is the current leader of the Labour Party. He, again, is old-school socialist, okay? He, he wants to nationalize everything at the drop of a hat. And as you probably have read in the news, the Labour Party at the moment is just ripping itself to shreds. Um, so, what are your feelings about this particular topic of where Bernie fits? From what a little I know of European politics, he fits into what they would probably call a near part of the world a social democrat. He would have some um, aspects of having public spaces, but at the same time not foreclosing private enterprise. Um, an example of that is Nicaragua. Nicaragua still had room for small business and people to be self-employed, but they did a lot to have a socialist revolution in Nicaragua when they had the revolution in 1979. But I, I think Bernie is actually closer to an FDR Democrat to a large extent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where, how I related to him. And to me, the label is less important than who he advocated for. He advocated for all of us, the 99%, the people that don't 
have access to political favors. And I've seen that there's a website called the Political Compass. That's not a website, but that's what they, one of the things they offer. And it looks at their voting record, uh, bills they've worked on, bills they sponsored. And he's a dead centerist on that. Hillary's to the right of him, the Republicans a little <clears> further <throat> right to him, but he's a really a dead centerist. centerist. Uh, more so than a socialist or anything like that. In the country, America is a s democratic socialist country. We have a lot of social programs, Medicaid, Social Security, et cetera, et cetera. And he wanted to expand a lot of that to make it better for the 99% versus the 1%, which is where we've been going for so long now that's broken our political system. Right. It's funny you should mention that because um, I'm thinking of Obamacare here. At the end of the Second World War, um, the Labour Party actually won the first election in 1946. And one of the first things they did was introduce to Great Britain socialized medicine called the National Health Service. And guess what? Not a single conservative government, of which there have been many, have ever mentioned the fact that they wanted to shut down the National Health Service. Because it's so good for the people. And it for the government. Everybody. It helps the government. It helps the mm -hmm. people. It's just a good series of programs. I know I've gone off script here, but excuse me, you mentioned it first. <laughs> I, I think one of the things about Bernie is, is he makes so much sense. He's coming from a thoughtful base of ideas. He was the only candidate who was talking about global warming. Mm -hmm. When he was asked what is the greatest threat to the United States, unabashedly, straight ahead, right up front, Global warming. These are the sorts of things that if you really take a close look at everything, taking care of people's health, that's not something that's a giveaway. It's something that's going to make the entire country stronger. And that's what Bernie talks about. And it's making sense when you have so many people who are talking about things that it just, it, I don't know how it fits in. Some of the stuff that, Ber that uh, Trump is talking about, I don't know how it fits in. I don't know how people get to a point where they can hear that and say, oh yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think we, we do have a bifurcation in the country between two very different kinds of ways of thinking. And one of the things I also have to give Bernie a lot of credit for was like, no, 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 this isn't about me. This is about the issues. Let's talk about the issues. Because yeah. I saw him do that on several interviews. It was kind of like, no, 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 no. It's not about who, the horse race here. It's about these are the issues. And so that's, uh, I think those are really important things. Yes. And, and I think, too, it, it's like uh, people in the United States, we are not a well-schooled, global understanding. We kind of, we, we hunker down and we kind of know what's going on in our communities in the United States. And when we talk about various uh, governments in various parts of the world, we have a little understanding, but we really don't have any kind of in-depth and we, we aren't, that's not, that's not one of the strengths that we have. That's so true, because when I first moved over here in 81, to me, America thought thought that the whole world ended in Maine and started in San Diego. <laughs> yeah. There's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, one thing that's important to bring out about Bernie's, he filled a huge vacuum. Yeah. And that was because of some policy choices mm -hmm. made that benefited the 1% and also some campaign choices to basically run campaigns that didn't stand for anything. And there's an old saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And it became like a default pattern that we would lose, we the Democratic Party would lose big in non-presidential years to the detriment of average folks because that would allow the gerrymandering and of course, then people go, well, what is the, what, why should I be involved in politics? We get all this nonsense that happens. And Bernie was a breath of fresh air and still is um, in terms of bringing in ideas, in terms of m people becoming empowered. And what I see from all of us in the Bernie movement, it's about moving things forward and looking to the future. It's not just about one election cycle. So let's, let's open it up a bit here because I've heard sort of like Bernie's revolution, it, it progressive. What, what does that really mean in context as a progressive movement? Is it to push these ideas forward and keep pushing and keep pushing until people start to listen? 
I, I think that um, one thing that, that Bernie did in that regard is he, the media isn't talking about what the issues are. And they haven't been talking about it for a long time. The, the, the media is owned by corporations. And mm. they don't want to talk about the things that don't, ha don't, uh, that don't benefit the 99%. The, the so Bernie brought those issues to the forefront and put it in our face and made us really start thinking about what are the things that we, are, we don't have that we need to fix, that we, are, that we aren't working on. That, that of and course, is when he got the coverage he so richly deserved. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, all we had was nine months of Trump did this, Trump did right. that, Trump right. did the other. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, there was a deal, I think, more than once where Bernie would actually be talking and they would cut away from Bernie talking to an empty podium. Um, I consider Trump to be a product of not only the dysfunction mm -hmm. and the extremism of the Republican Party, but also the mainstream media. They chose, in essence, to promote him because of this culture that worships the facade of wealth and the facade of prosperity. Um, you know, reality shows. And that's how we pick our presidential candidates. And I think Lynette <coughs> touched upon it definitely. Yes. The concentration of media ownership affects mm. the kind of information that we, the people, get. And of mm. course, there are a lot of distortions and omissions that they make a conscious choice to not educate and inform us about. Well, to me, I mean, uh, it's the definition varies on who you ask. But to me, somebody asked me that before, and I my definition of a progressive is somebody that looks at what's best for the people as a whole, the 99%, and what can we do to change, make bills and laws to help out the 99% and keep things moving for the benefit of the people as a whole, not the 1% one, the 1 or the corporations. And that's where Bernie got on the progressive movement. He really woke up a lot of progressive, and hopefully, and he won in my eyes, because he woke up the progressives. We organized behind him, hopefully we'll stay organized and moving it forward. I'm sure other people have a little, def a little different definition of progressives. That's good. Well, I mean, I, I agree with what, what, what you said and what you had said earlier about progressive. I think in my, in my eyes, um, Bernie, t Bernie talked about some things that we aren't talking about on the media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they, um, they, they don't want us to talk about those kinds of things. So they kind of tend to spin it and put a negative connotation on what progressive is. So, Kind of a de de to the definition of progressive depends on what camp you're in. You know, it can be a good thing, or it can be a bad thing. Right. And uh, I think, in, of course, in all of our eyes, it's probably a good, a progressive is a good word. But I think it mostly means that it's tr we're trying to make sure that we provide uh, a government that it, that meets the needs of all the people. Yeah. And that it comes from the grassroots, from the you know, from the bottom up, not the top down. Yeah. Because the problem is when you have a small group of people who control the system for a few people's benefit, it's going to be more authoritarian. It's going to, you have increased concentration of media ownership. You have oligopolistic uh, economic structure. And that affects how do we eat. That affects what kind of education our children get, what kind of environment we have. So if you have things come from the bottom up, you have more abilities for everyone, for lack of a better way to phrase it, to have a piece of the action and for us to have lives that we can live. And I was reflecting that a lot of us do this political stuff because we want to have good lives for our families, our friends, our communities. That's where it all comes from. It isn't just about abstract political things. I see politics as a means to an end, not an end to itself. Right. Yeah. The I love this phrase because it's, it just kind of says it. Everyone does better when mm. everyone does better. And it's when we understand that the most valuable asset that a country has is its people. And the most valuable part of people is their intellectual property. And if you rule from the top down, you're taking a very small ideology that's trying to protect its position up at the top rather than all of this intellectual property that's down below and letting it grow up and letting it, it, it flourish and, mm -hmm. and, and have its space. Yeah. And it's about doing the rational thing. We are a species that supposedly we're <laughs> rational, you know, and that's our claim to fame, right? Well, then we should get on board and get it done. Let's do that. Let's be rational. And I think that's what Bernie talked about. And the other thing about the, the word progressive 
it, it, too many times people allow enemies, and I hate to use the word enemy, people who are not for you and people who are trying to obfuscate what your message is, they make a characterization of you. Oh, progressives. Progressives are about, they're right next to communists. Oh, they're going to do all <laughs> these terrible things. And we allow that to be the statement. And so when Bernie came out and started talking, oh, I'm a democratic socialist. Everybody goes, oh, like this. But the point is, is when they heard him talking, they're going, hmm, that's just a word. You know, so Bernie, I think, did a great service in defining what it means to be a progressive. And so we have the responsibility now of carrying that forward and expanding what that means, but making the statement, making people understand and know what progressive, progressivism is. And I think part of it is, unfortunately, the way things work now is we get lectured a lot about the market or socialism, but we have a form of socialism that benefits those at the 1%, who those who are politically connected. Uh, I think of some, an example is I have some friends who are large L libertarians who are definitely not into a lot of government programs and government this or that, but yet they voted for the baseball stadium. So this is a form of corporate <laughs> welfare. Mm -hmm. And we don't seem to question, yeah, we get corporate welfare for those who have connections. But yeah, meanwhile, regular folks pound sand. They have crummy schools, don't have access to health care. So I think redefining what it means we have we should have socialism that benefits us all not just benefits a few and i like the idea of democratic socialism because we don't want a hard left ideology too that is as problematic as free market fundamentalism mm -hmm. interesting so how do you imagine that um, party politics are going to change after 2016 where, where, where do you see things shifting because I watched a lot of the primaries on both sides and it's if I just sat there going they're <laughs> not listening <laughs> they're not even listening to their own people I think that's true but I also think that Bernie really uh, activated people I, I know there's a lot of people who are running for office who are getting active mm -hmm. in their local politics and their local political issues um, because of Bernie and I hope that, that the people who uh, came out and volunteered for Bernie will stay active, and I, I think that's what he's going to try and do. I, I understand that. I mean, this was going to be one of my final mm. questions, but the DNC wasn't listening to Bernie. No. 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 But I think the Democratic Party has to listen to the progressives now. I mean, at the DNC, we were over 40% of the delegates there. In some states like Colorado, we were 64% of the people that caucused and moved on forward with our caucus primary complex system here, mm -hmm. which I know we're going to talk about later. Yes, we are. But uh, <laughs> the Democrats, you know, they are, they are scared. They are shaken up in many states because we were rowdy, we were motivated, we were angry, and we want to see things change. And a lot of the establishment politicians don't want to see things change. They have things nice and cushy. It's the way it's always been. It's the way it's going to stay. We don't want that. We want to change the system for the better of the majority, not just a few. Right. It, it's always made me laugh, actually, because you, you listen to the Republicans wanting to get rid of Obamacare and wanting to cut Social Security. And these, these words are coming from people who have the best social medicine program available, have the absolute solid concrete pension. Yeah, they want to get rid of everybody else's. It just infuriates me. Sorry, off topic. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, there's an absolute uh, point that are made by <coughs> Lynette and Jason that what we have now is not sustainable. The Republicans let themselves be taken over by extremists. And they also have, you know, it isn't just about Donald Trump. They have gone into demagoguery appealing to the fears and angers of white working class people, particularly men because they were in essence, I think they were kind of promised that their white privilege would insulate them from the excesses of our system. And guess what? I can think of the line from the movie Animal House, you know, the <laughs> essence, you blanked up, you trusted us kind of thing. And then meanwhile, the Democratic Party in some ways has ossified where they are more into protecting the privileges of those who are well connected than actually doing things for people. You look at the so-called triangulation, you look at the a trend away from FDR, democratic sort of values, and somewhere they get the idea that's how you win elections. 
when you see, especially in non-presidential years, that's a good way to get your you-know-what's kicked and a good way to alienate people. I did see some indication at the DNC committee level, and I, I am a newly elected DNC committee person, that they're starting to listen a little bit. It's kind of bit by bit. Now, the question is, is it going to be platitudes or is it going to be actually something constructive? And time will tell. Time will tell whether the party chooses to listen to progressives but not just those who um, have kind of done things the same way all the time. Because truthfully, it wasn't working. You know, when a lot of us went out there to try to work for our candidates and, you know, knowing that they're going to lose badly to people they shouldn't lose badly to. Mark Udall should not have lost to Cory Gardner. And a lot of it is he made some campaign choices that were puzzling at best, but part of it is we, the electorate, weren't paying attention to all the things that he did that mm -hmm. were good. I could have told you about Cory Gardner. Um, I could have told you, you know, in fact, I tried to, when I was phone banking and mostly talking to women my age and older, yeah, I could tell you about this guy. He's a pathological liar. <laughs> in why, but the problem is when the party doesn't choose to differentiate themselves and when they choose to, you know, in essence, um, cater to business interests in a not in a sustainable way, then, of course, it's not going to be good for regular people, for um, all of us. Not, it's just going to be good for a select few. And sometimes you wonder with some of these folks, would they rather lose and blame it on progressives, blame it on Ralph Nader, or blame it on Bernie, than have themselves be uncomfortable? I'm hoping not. I have some very cautious optimism, albeit cautious. We'll see how it shakes out. And but, but Jerry, don't you, don't you think that keeping the pressure up on the DNC and how to, mm -hmm. how to apply that pressure and, wh and where are the pressure points? And it's like yourself being uh, uh, on the actual rules committee and, and being more involved on the inside. Where are the pressure points? Where do we say, okay, this is what it should be? Good question. And I wasn't a rules committee person as such, although there may be an opening for some of us to get into the inner workings and figure out rules that are fair for anybody. That, those, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it needs pressure from within and from without. And as we learned from one of the forums I went to with Progressive Democrats of America, a lot of our political leaders should come organically from the community yes. and be able to articulate what do they have to offer people as their representative and as the uh, representative of their constituents. It shouldn't just be, I want to have some fancy title. What are they going to offer the people? And they were, I, I, I learned a lot from that. And they had people who have actually stepped up to run for office. And for what it's worth in Well County, we have five Bernie supporters running for office in three house districts and two county commissioner districts. And these were people that were recruited by the party uh, who, you know, at large. So. And Bernie put that call out, said, you know, I didn't win, but we need people to run. He put the call out, and he wants our evolutions mm -hmm. coming up on August 24th, his, uh, I guess, announcement of it. Kickoff. Kick Kickoff, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. But he wants to support 100 candidates uh, plus in the 2016 election. And we, the Bernatics, need to stand up and step up into positions, whether it's city council or precinct captains here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. We have a precinct system like mm -hmm. most states do. We need to stand up and get involved with the political system. We, it's, I think it's easier to change it from the inside versus complaining from the outside. You know, I'm going to stand up and run for different positions, and I hope many other Bernatics out there are going to do the same thing, mm -hmm. and give them pressure from the inside. Because we're going to have a voice, a better voice there. We're going to be voting on things to keep things moving forward in a progressive way. Right. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and we don't want to let we don't want to let the conversation get derailed by Republicans that are so often left field. You have to bring it back, and you have to constantly be making the statement. I think a lot of times campaigns can get a little off in the weeds when they say, "Well, what are the positions that I need to take so I can win?" Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. that's the, a leader is a leader, and that <laughs> leader should be someone should, who should be able to articulate, this is what I'm about, and this is why I'm about this. Yeah, the candidate running against Bernie, uh, Hillary, I think that was her big, she said, what polls best? What do I need to mm -hmm. talk about in this mm -hmm. area of the country to speak to these people yeah. to get their vote, not right. what message is the best one for the people as a whole? Right. And that's, a, and politicians are, most politicians are that way, unfortunately. Right. And it, it, as with anything, it's always balance. You know, you, when you run a campaign, you're obviously going to have to tailor a little here, tailor a little there. But 
we have to step up and follow Bernie's lead in saying, okay, this is, this is really what we need to be standing for. We can state it different ways. You know, mm -hmm. you can state the truth in a thousand different ways. <laughs> well, and I feel a little bit uh, more strongly than you do, uh, uh, do about whether or not the Democratic Party is going to uh, represent me. I know I'm helping a Democratic candidate run for office right now. I'm a paid staffer for Bob C. But, uh, and so I've, I've got to be careful about b being a good Democrat, and I am still a Democrat. But I just don't know. I really have a lot of questions. And being at the Democratic National Convention really made me question my uh, Democratic status even more because mm -hmm. I was so disillusioned by how we were treated and by how mm -hmm. things were run. Well, and uh, so it's a good segue. It's to it's a brilliant. Actually, I was going to say something. D Dwayne actually mentioned it when he was talking. And I, I, I found some interesting quotes. Some men change their party for the sake of their principles. Others, their principles for the sake of their party. You've seen the answer, mm. but can anyone tell me who said that? Winston Churchill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we should have guessed. Should have guessed. <laughs> 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 well, I tell you what, here's another good one, um, and I kind of like this. Politics is supposed to be the second oldest profession. I have come to realize that it bears a very close resemblance <laughs> to the first. <laughs> <laughs> who said that? I don't know. I know what the other profession is. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, Ronald Reagan. Ah, Interesting. Ah. Wow. Well, Reagan was a Democrat at one point. Yes. And then he became a Republican. Then, of course, he laid a lot of the groundwork for where we ended up now. And he was revered and supposedly this great guy, but he did a lot to hurt average people. Yeah, oh, he yeah. did. One, one of the things uh, w with candidates, we have to remember that candidates are individuals. Yeah. They are not a cookie-cutter stamp yeah. of the party principles. And so these people can be in a lot of different areas, uh, and they can have – they can – be different people. They yeah. are who they are. They can have one stand on one issue and a different stand on different issues and not be in alignment e with the e Democratic exactly. Party. Exactly. And, yeah. and what we as progressives need to do is to say, talk to us. Mm -hmm. Tell us where you're at. You know, if you can convince us we're ready to stand in, with you in your mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. If not, we're going to disagree. Mm -hmm. But we may still support you. At least tell us if, if there's, because we have a platform on a state level and a national level that has a lot of good things. I don't believe in using the platform as a thing to beat up people over the head, but I think they should at least look at it and at least say, where do you agree, where do you disagree, and why do you disagree, and what are your thoughts, and what are your solutions? When all they can come up with is, we just disagree, I think of some of our elected leaders who are choosing to disagree with Amendment 69. Okay, why do you disagree, and what are your solutions? We have an initiative process when the representative government system fails people, when people are still going without insurance or being underinsured. A good friend of mine had to cough up 500 bucks because he can't get health insurance through his work and it's cost prohibitive otherwise. That 500 bucks should have gone to get him insurance for crying out loud yeah. or form a single payer. Mm -hmm. My son has exactly the same problem. Yep. Anyway, let's talk about this. Now, whenever there's a convention, political convention in America, the rest of the world looks at these conventions <laughs> and they say to themselves, is this politics or is this a circus act? <laughs> because nowhere, nowhere does any country hold conventions like this country. It is jaw-dropping to everybody. People jumping up and down, balloons everywhere. <laughs> oh, my God, there's not an American flag on stage. The, oh, it's ending, it's ending. <laughs> it, 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 you know... Now, you three were there. You were in there. You were with the crowds. So what did you actually take away from the convention? And, and what do you actually think about these conventions? Do you think they're a good thing, a bad thing? Well, you know, if I had to summarize the DNC, it was just an infomercial. We were seat warmers and cheerleaders. We weren't there to make a difference at all. We were there to show we're supporting, the, we're united behind this one candidate. And other than that, it was people building their stock speeches for their campaign. It was speeches from 5 o'clock until 11.30 or later every night. There was no, there was no persuading people to your side. There was no, nothing we could vote on to make a difference. We were just seat warmers and cheerleaders. The thing that shocked me the most, and I, other people don't seem to be as upset about this, but maybe I just need my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but 
we didn't, I got 12 hours of sleep in four days. Mm -hmm. And I have some diet restrictions. I didn't eat good food for four days. I mean, it was really shocking what we were required to do in order to be delegates. And I have to say, I'm really proud of our delegation. We were there all the time. We were doing what we were supposed to do. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of restrictions that we couldn't have food there. We couldn't be seen on the TV camera eating. We couldn't have any water. We couldn't go to the bathroom. If we did, we'd get our seat filled by a seat filler. And I was shocked. I was shocked that they expected that we would be able to go to, go to, be, get, go to bed at 2, 3 o'clock at night and be, had to be up at 8 o'clock in the morning to get our credentials. I mean, it was really, uh, it was really a lot. It, it was really took a lot out of you. It was too much. It was too much. Yeah. There were a that lot of things. Um, there were things I liked. There were things I didn't like. I didn't like the way some delegates were treated. We had a mm -hmm. blind delegate in our delegation who got totally jerked around for no good reason. Um, I, I kind of knew going in this was going to be a coronation, you know, is the word that I've, it's not my word, but I've heard it before. Mm -hmm. I think that the, you know, when there seems to be more leeway for freedom of speech outside the convention, and from what I had heard, the Philadelphia caps were pretty much hands off. They let people do their thing, but they were so almost obsessed with a tight script. And, and as a party official slash party hack, I'm not opposed to unity in theory, but you don't have to force feed it. That was kind of the takeaway I got. Although there were some extraordinary moments and things worth considering. Several of the speeches I thought they had a, very, a lot of very good things mm -hmm. to say. So I can't say it was all bad. No. Now is this the best way in knowing how many gazillion dollars was spent on this thing? And Lynette referred to the crappy food. I brought stuff in later in the week and I brought my <laughs> water bottle in. Although I, I snuck in stuff, but I wasn't supposed to. Because it was annoying yeah. that, yeah, they tell you can't bring the stuff in, but they charge you overpriced crappy food that you have to wait in line. In fact, you were in line and you got to talk to, I didn't even know. I, I didn't hang out with Jerry Springer for 45 yeah. minutes in line <laughs> waiting. And I get the end of the line after 45 minutes and they had hot dogs. So I was left. Right. They had <laughs> at 30 at night and we still had three more hours at least to go. Yeah. I didn't recognize Jerry Springer. It's pretty oh funny. But God. it's like, I, I think I'd maybe seen this show once and I kind of knew the general premise so I didn't watch it. He's been running a political podcast for 10 years. He, he used to be the mayor of Cincinnati, was it? I think, it, yeah. So he's, he's a political yeah. person too. Right. We talk politics. It was a yeah. good conversation. And that's, and that's good that you got to connect with him. And, but there was such an annoyance. People with dietary restrictions. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping as a DNC committee person, it's like, you know, things like you should be able to bring in an empty water bottle and fill the darn thing up to where you're not having all this wastage. You should be able to have all sorts of food that is available and affordable. Because um, mm. a lot of these concession stands didn't even have, they were closed. You couldn't even get food. And it's, it's nuts what they did. It, it shouldn't be jerking around. They'd have a little presentation about disabled folks. Okay, great. Nothing wrong with helping disabled folks because we're all going to be disabled in some form as we get older. But then you jerk around people. You know, our, our, our delegate friend Mark, uh, I heard other stories people needed rides, but yet they're using the golf carts for the VIP folks mm -hmm. when they could have easily walked. You know, just stuff like that. It's kind of a disconnect yeah. Yeah. between the the, what they're trying to present. And that, to me, was the most glaring example was how you treat regular folks who aren't part of the upper echelon and how Bernie folks were treated. You know, they had a bunch of volunteers who went there on their own dime and they weren't even credentialed. They were kind of, you know, shoved away. And, and that was not good. So yeah, they, they didn't get to go get in. Yeah, and the Bernie folks were delegates were definitely, um, I say mistreated, but definitely mistreated in some way, especially Mark. Like, he had to fight so hard to get his sighted assistant on the floor with them. And several times they tried to pull her off the floor so they could sit somebody's wife who's, uh, pol politician in the Colorado party. The Hillary delegates are all to the right and they had friends coming down taking up seats and we were already two sheets, two or three seats short in the first place so we had credentialed Bernie delegates that couldn't even sit in the seats because they were taken up by a politician's wife or something like that who was sitting down there just for fun. Can I quote you on that? All of Hillary's people were to the right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we thought that was kind of funny too. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting. I like that. One of the highlights is our blind candidate had a Braille protest mm. sign. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, I, think I love it. And he brought a it. blackout mask with yeah. Jonathan Singer, uh, walked around as a blind person. Did you, did you? I, I was going to, but never got around to doing oh. it. So he walked around and got a lot of interviews and attention for that and called out the, uh, how the ADA, they, they were talking about ADA helping out for this, and then our blind delegate was getting neglected so, bad, so poorly. That's bad. It was not let, good. Let, let, let's move on to something else because as a Brit, this is something that I want to have explained to me. Why are the primaries in some states 
why are there caucuses in other states, and who the hell thought <laughs> that a superdelegate was a good thing to have? <laughs> and let's not just have one, let's have hundreds of them. <laughs>